Good afternoon, and to our friends on Eastern Time, good evening. Welcome to the 2022 American Craft Council Awards Celebration. I'm Andrea Specht, and it is my great privilege to serve as the Executive Director of the American Craft Council, a position I have held for just over four months. I mentioned this to you because this is my first ever ACC Awards celebration, and I am so pleased to be sharing this event with all of our award recipients and everyone who is joining us via Zoom across the United States and beyond. I'm speaking with you today from St. Paul, Minnesota, the fraternal twin city of Minneapolis, where ACC is based. The Twin Cities are located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. In making this land acknowledgement, I invite you to consider the land on which you live and the complex confluence of legacies that bring you to stand where you are, including through critical reflection and conversation with your own community. A few technical and logistical reminders before I continue. Please make sure that your camera is off and that your microphone is muted for this program. We welcome you to share comments and kudos via the chat feature. Closed captioning is available. On the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a CC symbol. Clicking on that symbol will turn this feature on and off. This program will also be recorded and available for future viewing. The American Craft Council is a national nonprofit working to keep craft artists and the craft community connected, inspired, and thriving. One of the ways that we do this is by celebrating craft's legacy through the awards program that brought us all together tonight. Before I introduce our awards program chair, I would like to thank and recognize my ACC staff colleagues, particularly Programs Manager, Legacy and Editorial, Rachel Messerich, whose commitment to this event is an inspiration, IT Operations Manager, Jason Samuels, for attending to the myriad technical details that make this event possible, our marketing team, and ACC librarian, Beth Goodrich. Thank you also to the Windgate Foundation for its support of our awards program, as well as the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Friends of the ACC Library and Archives, the Minnesota State Arts Board, and all of the donors and members who make all of our work possible. Last but not least, I would like to thank the ACC Board of Trustees, represented at this event by Board Chair Gary Smith, and the person I will now introduce. It is my great pleasure to hand the virtual microphone to ACC Trustee, Awards Program Chair, artist and ACC fellow in his own right, Tom Lozier, who joins us from his home in Madison, Wisconsin. Tom, thank you so much for your leadership and your passion for these awards and all the work that you have contributed to bring us to where we are at this moment. And Tom, if you could please turn your camera back on. Hello. Hi. I'm handing the microphone to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome to everybody. And welcome to the 2022 American Craft Council Award Ceremony. I'm Tom Loser. I'm a woodworker, furniture maker, and ACC fellow, current trustee, and I'm honored to be the current chair of the ACC Awards Program. <clears throat> the American Craft Council Awards began in 1975 as a way to recognize those individuals and organizations who are advancing the field in a myriad of ways. I love working on this program because it gives us a chance to recognize and honor an amazing group of artists and contributors that all have a long history of expanding the boundaries of our field. When I received a phone call in 2012 telling me that I'd been selected as a fellow of the ACC, to be honest, I did not know much about the program and had only a general idea that this might be a good thing. Now that I've been more directly connected with the program from the administrative side and have had a chance to look under the hood, what makes me particularly excited and enthusiastic about the awards program is how it identifies and honors a stream of creative talent over an extended time period. The ACC has been recognizing artistic legacy for almost 50 years. The ever increasing pool of artists and contributors that the awards committee recognizes offers one evolving and very dynamic history of craft. 
Today, we'll honor a total of 20 individuals, the six gold medalists. That's an honor bestowed on those who have been previously recognized as fellows. We'll also recognize eight new fellows and three new honorary fellows. All were nominated by their colleagues and peers in the field and selected by a subcommittee made up of previous awardees. This year, the subcommittee is Susan Cummins, Tina Oldno, Ann Currier, Pat Hickman, Mary Lee Hu, and Beth Lippman. We would like to thank them for their time, passion, and dedication to the field and to this program. The two recipients of the Eileen Osborne Webb Award for Philanthropy and the Award of Distinction Honoree are nominated and selected by the ACC Board of Trustees. So we have an awesome collection of creativity and talent in the house today, and we have a lot of ground to cover in what we think will run about an hour and 40 minutes or so. Today, the award recipients will be introduced by members of the award subcommittee and that group will be joined by two guest presenters, Roseanne Summerson and Wendy Mariyama, who have particular connections to two of our awardees. Gary Smith, the chair of the Board of Trustees, will present the Award of Distinction. And Andrea Specht, who you just met, the executive director of the ACC, will present the Eileen Osborne Webb Awards for Philanthropy. As Andrea mentioned, the entire awards program and the subcommittee's work is supremely well overseen and supported by Rachel Meserich, from the ACC staff. Huge thanks to Rachel. This year, the awards subcommittee was passionate and opinionated, but also collaborative and expansive in their thinking, successfully pushing for the recognition of a bigger group of awardees than is the precedent of this program. The committee did this in, pre in appreciation of the large cohort of artists representing decades of creative leadership that have clearly earned this honor many times over. And I think this bigger cohort is also an indication that we recognize and acknowledge that we're still not able to celebrate all of the artists that deserve this honor. The awards subcommittee makes its selections from a list of nominated candidates. The nominators that submit those names for consideration are the pool of previous award recipients. Additionally, in the two most recent cycle, we've included a small pool of invited nominators with the goal of increasing the range and diversity of the nominee pool. One interesting aspect of the program is that the awards committee, of course, considers the 2022 nominations, but the committee also looks backwards at previous lists of nominations to see who may have been nominated over several award cycles. None of the awardees that we're celebrating today is receiving this recognition based on just a single nomination. They have all been pushed to the fore by numerous nominators and in multiple award cycles. We're gonna to start today, uh, we're going to start by watching a 10 minute video that briefly introduces each awardee. Later towards the end of the program, we'll see another 10 minute trailer. These short trailers were put together by Chikara Motomura, pulling brief excerpts from longer video interviews he prepared about each artist. We hope the two trailer segments will tempt you to then venture to the ACC website where each awardee's individual profile page also includes the long play version of these informative and moving videos. They are fantastic. The individual pages for each awardee also include images of each artist's work and additional hot links if you want to dig deeper. After the initial trailer, each awardee will be introduced by a team of presenters. And then after part two of the trailer, the awardees will all be invited on camera to open the physical award that they received in the mail. And then everyone in attendance today will be invited on camera for a toast and social time. So thanks for being here and let's get started with part one of the video. I was uh, doing ceramics at UC Berkeley. And it was downstairs on the first floor. And then upstairs, they started a glass blowing department. I went up there and watched and I, and the, the guy, he was in there working by himself. As I was watching him, he pushed on a piece of glass and it broke and he cut his hand really bad like oh my god here let me take you let me take you he said no go away go away go away so he left he went to the 
he went down the hall to the office and I was just left in the glass shop and the doors were open and pipes were up there and, and nobody was around. So I just started blowing glass. I just, you know. I was asked to take a elective out of my program area. I was walking down the hallway one day, I think it was my sophomore year, I saw this ceramics studio and it was fascinating. And I walked in there and I thought, well, I'll sign up for that. Well, once I took that class, I'd never left. It was, it just was hypnotic. I would stay there day and night. I took a bus trip, Greyhound bus trip to Mexico and traveled all over. And I went and saw a lot of indigenous uh, people weaving uh, down in Chiapas and various different parts of Mexico. And that, that, that's what fascinated me. That's how I got my inspiration. I had been on uh, working on a DC-8 project, which was Douglas's first jumbo jet, and went to Europe on a mission to put missiles along the east coast of England. I was 27 years old. I thought, I've, I've got to figure things out. And that's when I got on the ship in London. I got on a cargo ship, and for $500, I was able to go to Hong Kong. Then in India is where it all happened, where they had a tribute to Gandhi, a pavilion in the park. And here were people who were spinning, they were weaving, and they were dying. And I thought, I want to be a part of this. An undergraduate, I was a sculptor. And after getting out of undergraduate school, I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And of course, the whole uh, Native American Southwest art was very connected to weaving and blankets and also baskets. I went to art school to study painting. <laughs> I wasn't a particularly good painter, <laughs> but I married an, another painter and we really couldn't afford to buy furniture to put in our apartment and so I just went to the lumber yard and bought a few boards and made a little table and a little uh, couch table and you know a few other things that we needed and pretty soon people started asking me if I'd make one of those for them. And... 35 years ago in my regular job. I traveled a lot. I, I was an engineer and I would take in art shows and I saw quilts at galleries selling at that time for enormous prices. And I wondered if those prices were trickling down to the makers of those quilts. I borrowed a friend's wood lathe and uh, uh, fell in love with the process and I uh, realized that I was better suited to the lathe as in turning because uh, it, it's more intuitive. You know, I, uh, I found that I was comfortable with the subtractive process, which is what wood turning is. And so I started um, selling my furniture making equipment and buying wood lathes. It's hard to sort of say when I started working in my field. You know, living in Queens in the 60s, you know, going to Manhattan was tantamount to like going to California. You know, it was just so exciting. And there were several of my art history uh, majors with me and we started going to galleries. I think it was 1977, my advisor, Ann Morgan, uh, she was writing for the New Art Examiner in Chicago, which is an interesting magazine because it wasn't New York based. And so she took me to see the editor, the person who founded the magazine. So he said, well, here's a couple of shows you can review if you want. So I reviewed these shows in Chicago and that's how I began. In the mid eighties, I was very interested in ways to create a sense of gender confusion. Uh, I was with a, a circle of friends who were really interested in messing with conventional notions of gender. It would seem quite tame at this point, but um, I got interested in jewelry, particularly just sort of thrift store finds and things like that. I started beading when I was about eight years old. Um, my, I grew up on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming with the Shoshone and Arapaho. Um, on that reservation, my mother had a trading post for over 25 years 
And in that trading post, she sold uh, lots of things, but mostly beadwork beadwork that was made by the people from that reservation, but also from all over the United States. The process where in which I work is, it is all, altogether cathartic. I mean, it is uh, from the beginning to the end, and then there are periods along the way that are especially moving, you know, they're especially poignant. Um, one is the gesture, when the gesture can work, right away i get the feeling that this is going to this character is actually going to live or it has a potential spirit or this is this is where i i can see the life already in this character and then at the end in the in the detailing i get a lot of that uh like are you gonna are you gonna live for me are you gonna are you gonna come all the way into life after high school in 1982, Dante got me a job in a glass factory called the Glass Eye Studios. Dante and I were very close and we worked together on the same team for a number of years, uh, making Christmas balls, paperweights. We made uh, you know, small production wear, vases and things like that. So we were really developing our skills through working in the factory. I had been invited in 1988 to travel to Tasmania to be a, an artist in residence at the University of Tasmania, the School of Art. So I was there for uh, four months and then on my way home I stopped in Fiji uh, to do the same and that was when I uh, had the good fortune of meeting Maki Tikoto. I started out as um, a, a kind of a pre-vet major it just didn't agree with me very well and so I, I ended up starting off in photography and gradually ended up in the ceramic studio and it was a place that more than any place I've ever been as a, ever had been as a young person felt like home. I went three summers to Skidmore. I came home for a weekend and driving back I drove through I never drove to a rainstorm like that. So I pulled over and I sat there in this hail and lightning and I mean, just, it was like sheets of water over the car. I mean, this was really a, such an experience. So I was making a piece up there and what to do about this rain. So I found some plastic tubing I got it, I painted it, and then I, I had to attach it. So I found some wire in, in the studio and I used the wire to attach it. I thought that was really interesting. I liked working with that material. So that was really sort of my first adventure with non-traditional materials. I really began working in the field of textiles when I was a child because my grandmother had been a seamstress in New York and she lived with us. And so I remember at six years old, bugging her to teach me how to sew by hand. And then later when I was eight, my mother taught me on the machine. I'm Charlotte Herrera and I'm really a craft lover and collector. I've been at the organizer of our fine craft show at the Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester, New York, which is where I live. My name is Patty Young. I live in Kensington, Maryland. I am a craft advocate. I was weaned on American Craft Council shows uh, through a gallery in Washington that I had a, a friend who was, uh, you know, she was represented by them and I worked for that gallery in my 20s. Patrick's father built the family home in Malibu, California, using house facades of old Hollywood movie sets, which he brought home. Imagine growing up inside a hodgepodge patchwork of different house fronts. Jim traveled home from England and the U.S. Army via cargo ship, seeing people making things. The textiles he experienced along the way spoke to him. 
The GI Bill allowed him to get degrees from UCLA, where he came to mentor and foster generations of artists through his teaching. He was also greatly influenced by living in Oaxaca with his family for 10 years. His work is part of the continuum of the world of textiles. He is driven by ideas and processes using very simple tools, celebrating the honesty and beauty of the handmade in his work and in his life. Jim draws on complex weave structures with historic reference, uniting the past with the present in responding to contemporary political and environmental issues, bringing nuance and humor to his sophisticated artwork. Jim confronts our times as he weaves yet another flag, always fresh and new. His latest piece expresses his deep sense of sadness and frustration. He's woven stripes using agave fibers colored with natural dyes, indigo, madder root, and avocado pits, and embroidered 50 stars falling out of their field, seemingly unraveling. He says of his own work, weaving is at the center of how I attempt to understand and respond to this changing world. It takes a lot of time. Sometimes the outcome is not nearly as interesting as the journey to get there. Please join me in congratulating Jim Bassler upon receiving the gold. Thank you, Pat. Beth and Leah, if you could please turn your cameras back on. Thank you. It is my honor to introduce Leah Cook. Leah Cook has spent her acclaimed career voraciously exploring aspects of weaving and imagery. She works in a multitude of media combining weaving with painting, photography, video, and digital technology. Cook deftly incorporates data from behavioral and neurosciences, complicating our relationship to the subject and co-opting the viewer's gaze. Cook is concerned with our visceral reaction to an image in cloth, as well as our bodily reaction to the material. How does the reaction to a textile differ from a photograph, a computer screen, a painting? In the mid 90s, Cook began using jacquard looms to translate family photos into woven narrative works. Her use of the jacquard loom to construct and deconstruct an image profoundly reflected the advent of the digital revolution. The tapestries allude to a visual vocabulary for the systems that now define our collective reality. On a personal note, I've closely followed the work of Leah Cook since I was a student at Tyler School of Art in the 90s. Struggling to express myself through the process of weaving, I was and remain awestruck by her masterful, subtle, and contemporary portraits and tapestry. Cook breaks open the door to the representational in textile over and over again. She trailblazes the way forward through the process into the unknown. Please join me in congratulating Leah Cook as she is recognized as a gold medalist of the American Craft Council, its highest honor for a lifetime of achievements. Roseanne, please come on. I have the talk on you. No? Hi. Um, it's, are we set? You are set. Go ahead, please. It's a pleasure to be here to introduce Judy McKee, who doesn't hardly need an introduction. 
but to be here as part of this wonderful um, opportunity for her to receive the gold medal from the American Crafts Council, which is its highest honor. And Judy is so well deserved of this award. As a furniture maker and artist, she has essentially created her own genre in the field of studio furniture, um, making work that is so distinctively Judy. And that work includes materials of bronze and wood and paint and stone. But the consistent features of all of her work have to do with this quiet, timeless elegance that also has a bit of a sense of humor. And I would say that those characteristics are very much like Judy. Uh, Judy's, uh, Judy and I first met in the wood shop um, some four decades ago and have remained colleagues and really close friends ever since. And it's just been awe-inspiring to watch her work develop over those years and to, to think about the pieces that she creates almost as living in the world because they have so much of an animate sense about them, but yet they're so timeless and elegant that um, they can live as uh, objects on their own. Um, anyway, I'm just delighted that Judy is here to receive this award, and I want to extend my deep congratulations to you, Judy. Well, thank you very much. I am delighted to be receiving this award, and I appreciate it very much. I didn't prepare a talk, so I'm just saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And <laughs> That's enough. That's good. Okay. For the 1997 book I wrote on Richard Marquis, known as Dick, I had to supply a paragraph for the dust jacket, and this is what I wrote. Richard Marquis, a self-described glassblower and collector of beat-up, vintage objects, has had an extraordinary influence on the development of contemporary studio glass in America and around the world. As an artist, he is admired for his understanding of color and form, as well as for his humor and willingness to experiment. As a glass blower, he has influenced an entire generation of artists working in glass who aspire to his technical mastery and the originality of his vision. And, you know, what can you really say after that? So this short introduction for someone whose remarkable career has spanned more than 50 years will focus on some of the things that are important to Dick. He has always been a dog lover. He has always been a maker and a collector of objects. And he has pursued these activities in a way that can only be described as extreme. Artists are problem solvers, says Dick. We create our own problems and hopefully we solve them. As a person, Dick is unpredictable, yet he is highly disciplined. Similarly, his work is unpredictable, disciplined, and rife with other contradictions. It is humorous and intellectual, intentionally unintentional, sincere and ironic, practical and impractical, smart and dumb, elegant and stumblebum. Like the outsider artists that he admires, Dick's world is unique and in constant invention. His objects are an element, almost a byproduct of an elaborate universe under construction. Dick's distinctive style, love of material and engagement with the process of making shines through the clever content of his pieces, resulting in charismatic objects that have their own logic, integrity and intention. I cannot think of a more fitting person to award any kind of gold medal to than Dick Marquis. And I am gratified that the American Craft Council has chosen to recognize him with their coveted one. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm honored and grateful and humbled to be among my other prestigious colleagues. And thanks, Tina. Thank you. I am overjoyed to be introducing John McQueen. Basket maker John McQueen has been investigating the concepts of containment, presence and absence, 
and exteriority and interiority in wildly innovative small and large scale sculptures. At times lyrical, at times representational, the baskets confront and seduce the viewer with their raw materiality and unexpected forms. Embedded text becomes distorted, illegible, and subverted in McQueen's vessels, taking on new interpretive power. In McQueen's own words, even an idea like a sentence is contained. It has a beginning and an end. Go down the list. There are thousands of things. If you wanted to, you could connect them all to baskets. Some of the sculptures nod towards the corporal, fibrous orifices suggesting organs or cavities. For John McQueen, materials inspire concept as well as composition. The work of weaving or assembling a basket parallels other life processes of gathering, refining, and building. John, I took a workshop with you in the early 90s at Peters Valley School of Crafts. Your generosity and vision deeply inspired my practice. I gained a sense of freedom and spontaneity that was unaccessible to me prior to working with you. The vitality of your practice and the generosity of your spirit altered the trajectory of my practice in a very short period of time. Thank you. Please join me in congratulating John McQueen as he is recognized as a gold medalist of the American Craft Council, its highest honor for a lifetime of achievements. Okay. It is also my honor to introduce Patty Warshina. Patty Warshina closely studies the human condition. Her figurative sculptures capture the absurdity of the corporal and its escapades. Her work processes and filters current socio-political events through an autobiographical lens. The stylized reductive figures engage in actions that defy a singular perspective, freeing the viewer to interpret the work in diverse and expansive ways. Her sustaining interest in the human figure generates from her own daily existence. The sculptures capture the time and place that she inhabits. Patty has asked me to share this statement with you. As a Seattle art student during the early 60s, I recall anxiously awaiting the next Craft Horizons magazine to read about the evolving experimental development of the craft and ceramic movement within the United States, whose cultural history was still young. My admiration for the innovative pioneer artists of this time was inspiring and illusory, but most compelling. Therefore, I want to thank the members of the American Craft Council for this unbelievable honor, for without those early innovative visions, publications, and organizations to support the United States and later the international craft movement by the council, I would not be here today. Thank you for giving me this creative life. Please join me in congratulating Patty Warshina as she's recognized as a gold medalist of the American Craft Council. Once again, it's highest honor for a lifetime of achievements. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> so great. Terry, please turn your camera on, please. Hi, Terry. It is my deep pleasure to be introducing Terry Greaves. Terry Greaves is a masterful beadworker whose multifaceted works celebrate aspects of historical and contemporary Kiowa life by depicting anecdotes of oral history and archetypal patterns in exquisitely wrought canvases of beads. Her work at times appropriates iconic symbols of mass culture, 
such as Chuck Taylor's sneakers, as platforms for traditional beadwork. An enrolled member of the Kiowa Indian tribe of Oklahoma, her work is steeped in the tradition of her family and ancestors and pays tribute to the unseen labor of women. A graduate of UC Santa Cruz, Greaves has won Best of Show at Santa Fe Indian Market, was featured in PBS's Craft in America, and was named a United States Artist Distinguished Fellow in Traditional Arts. Her work is in numerous public collections, including the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, the Denver Art Museum in Colorado, and the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. Greaves is known as a curator and scholar, as well as a maker. She co-curated Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists with Jill Alberg Yohi. Hearts of Our People was the first major national traveling exhibition devoted to the art of the Native American women. Greaves and Yohi's claim that the majority of museum held Native American cultural artifacts were in fact made by women, has brought a foundational change in the ways that these collections have been recontextualized. Please join me in congratulating Terry Greaves as she is recognized as a fellow of the American Craft Council. Congratulations. Aho, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this um, honor, for recognizing me, and um, thank you to the American Craft Council for recognizing Native American beadwork as a viable form of American craft. Aho. Karen Hampton is committed to creating artwork that responds to the lives of her ancestors. Through her lens of anthropology and genealogy, she travels in her ancestors' footsteps, exploring plantations where they were enslaved, doing extensive primary research, walking the roads where they lived. Karen puts herself in her work. She is a gifted storyteller, pricking with needle on cloth, whether digitally printed, handwoven, dyed, or on aged linen. Her cloth carries the hopes and visions of African-American lives, telling their stories from her perspective. The power of her conceptually based narrative fiber art has won her a major commission for Metro Art Los Angeles. The purple D-line extension transit project is replacing a bus line she took when she was growing up. It will open in 2027 at the Westwood UCLA station. Karen's visual examination and investigation of the multi-layered and complicated history of America will be translated into mosaic tiles, celebrating Los Angeles and its diversity and vibrancy of culture and communities. Please join me in congratulating Karen Hampton. I'm sorry, Karen, can you please unmute and say that again, please? Um, I was saying thank you, Pat. And I also wanted to really thank the American Craft Council because this is truly felt in my heart. Thank you. And Nancy, can you please turn your camera on, please? Did you turn it on? Yeah. Okay. Nancy Cunningsberg is urban New York. In her artwork, she reflects the city with its complexity and tangle of people and traffic, racing, crossing, layering, interlocking. Nancy used to work in soft materials, yarn and fabric, knitting and crocheting them. Now it's copper and steel narrow gauge industrial wire, 
strong, flexible materials which lend themselves to the manipulation necessary as she makes knots and nets, drawing in wire. The end results in her two-dimensional, three-dimensional lace-like work are both delicate and fragile, containing shadow and light, reserving space for air and breath. Nancy is also the Textile Study Group of New York, one of its founders 45 years ago. Her presence over the years has enabled that organization to thrive. She generously hosts, welcomes speakers, encourages national and international programming, and supports others in the field. Oh, nice. The standard of excellence that Nancy engenders has created a membership across the country. Her commitment to the field and her ongoing active making are an inspiration present in every fiber of her 95 years. Please join me in celebrating and congratulating Nancy Cunningsburg. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so delighted that you're the one who's saying these words because you have really been an inspiration to me, Pat. And this award means a lot to me and to the organization, the Textile Study Group, to which I have given a lot of time and love. Thank you. Thank you. I've known Keith Lewis since he was in graduate school in the 1990s. In fact, I showed his thesis work in a gallery I ran in Mill Valley, California in 1993, the year he graduated from Kent State. Keith's work was exceptional and provocative. I had no idea what my audience would think of it, but I thought it was fantastic and courageous. His jewelry at the time dealt with issues of queer identity as well as sexual freedom, politics, and larger questions about loss, memory, and history. These were not the ornamental objects we think of as jewelry. In fact, they were far from it. Tackling the weighty themes and demonstrating how ambitious jewelry could be when it came to subject matter. These brooches and necklaces screamed out loud about the injustice of the AIDS pandemic and the oppressive treatment of homosexuals by the public. In one necklace, he memorialized 35 specific people who he knew died from AIDS. Can you imagine 35 people gone from your life and the fear you also carry of catching the virus and dying too? The 36th soul in the necklace is Keith himself. In other brooches, people he knew were remembered by name and given the head of an animal whose essence was most evocative of that person. A dog, a stag, a mouse, a cat, and so forth. Many of these figures had sizable erections, indicating the pleasure and joy they experienced from sex. Keith is all about sex. From the politics that surrounded sexual freedom in the gay community and the aggressive attempts by conservative politicians and religious leaders to use AIDS as a weapon against sex itself, to the visual codes that depict sex in different cultures, such as porn in our own time, or sexually explicit murals and phallic objects that were buried in Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius erupted. This is a topic that makes most Americans squirm, but Keith reveled in it. At the same time, he had conflicting feelings about sex too. He was discussed, he was discussed in artist talks. He has discussed in artist talks his experience of survivor's guilt and ambivalence that comes from any sexual encounter, possibly being a vector for infection. Why didn't he get the virus? Is it okay that he makes a living from commemorating those who died of AIDS? In Keith's jewelry, sex expresses the fully vulnerable contradictions and rich richness of being human, of our desires and fears, and the fragile wonder of reaching out to one another, seeking comfort and pleasure in another body. Controversial topics have never been welcome subjects in the cozy craft world. We don't like to be provoked or have struggle, have to struggle too much with our feelings about objects we own, especially if we wear them on our bodies. I have to applaud Keith for the courage he's shown to expose himself and us in this way. 
From 1994 to the present, Keith has taught at Central Washington University in Ellensburg, Washington. It is a school in Eastern Washington that has a hollowed place in the history of American jewelry. Ramona Solberg and Ken Corey taught there before him, and the school is known as the birthplace of Northwest funk jewelry. Although Keith has only had a few solo shows, he's been in countless regional, national, and international exhibitions, and his jewelry has been featured in many articles. A book on Keith and his work is in the making, which should be released next year, and it includes a number of his wonderful artist talks, as well as insightful observations by art historian Damian Skinner. His work is held by the following museums, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Arts and Design, the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, the Racine Art Museum, the Renwick Gallery, the Tacoma Art Museum, the Pinacothek de Moderne in Munich, and the Victorian Albert Museum in London. For Keith, the making of jewelry is a political act and an expression of his personal relationship to human illness, memory, vulnerability, and death. He says a lot with his jewelry. Please joining me, please join me in congratulating Keith on joining the College of Fellows. Thank you very much, Susan, and thanks to the ACC for this honor. It means a lot to me. Thanks. It's my, uh, my name is Wendy Moyama, and it's my honor to be able to introduce Christina Madsen. Um, as young girls, you know, we've learned to nurture friendship between other girls, starting at a very young age. Later, this would prove to be an invaluable lesson. And as years progress, our long-term friendship with other women are unique and supportive. This would prove to be true amongst women woodworkers. I first met Christina Madsen in 1977. We, along with Judy McKee, Roseanne Summerson, and Dale Fadal, built a friendship of mutual respect, of sharing and connecting over all these years. In those early years, there was only a handful of women in our field, and this made our friendship even more invaluable. We all certainly encountered sexism in its first for glory. It was not easy, but it was great to have people to share that experience with. And I think it made us all stronger and more resilient. Christina has an esteemed lineage as a craft practitioner. She learned needlework from the women in her family, became highly skilled with handwork at a very early age. As the woodworker, this lineage continued when she studied with David Power, who had, who had himself been a pupil of, uh, of uh, a very well-known British furniture maker named Edward Barnsley. In addition, Christina apprenticed under Makiti Koto, a master carver from Fiji, Christina lived with Makiti's family for nine months, absorbing not only the, the knowledge of carving, but also the culture of Fiji. What resulted was an incredible mashup between all three of those influences, and that became Christina Madsen's signature work. There is no other designer maker like Christina. Each decade of work shows an amazing growth, starting with supreme knowledge and skill as a furniture maker, a refinement of design and proportion, 
and experimentation with textiles and surfaces, being able to turn the skill of the Fijian carving technique into her own palette, incorporating through the use of scraffito, carving through different layers of veneer and or pigment. I can't wait to see what she does in the next decade. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Christina Madsen into the College of Fellows. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Um. I'm standing in for Ann Courier. <clears throat> Ann Courier very much wanted to be here to introduce Mark Ferris. She cared passionately. She cares passionately about this nomination, but she has a conflict that prevents her from joining us. And she's prepared these comments and given me permission to read them for her. So Ann wrote this for the ACC newsletter when, we, when, the, when first announcing the 2022 fellows. Over the past decades, Mark Ferris has brought an invigorating and contemporary vitality to the traditional conventions of pottery, finding shape, surface, and color through a lens that playfully captures and interprets architectural and geometric references. Generous as an educator, Mark is highly respected by individuals who feel fortunate to have had him as a teacher. And then for today's occasion, she sent us the following additional materials. While preparing additional remarks to introduce Mark Ferris, I remembered that in 2011, the Fosdick Nelson Gallery at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University mounted an ambitious exhibition called Table Space, a Framework for Contemporary Ceramics. It was curated by Linda Sakora and Albion Stafford, and Mark was one of 14 artists invited to participate. The exhibition was accompanied by a comprehensive catalog and the forward to that catalog was written by the scholar Howard Rosati. A wonderful coincidence to note on this occasion today. And the catalog included statements by each artist. In rereading Mark's comments in that catalog, I've concluded that his own words refreshingly open and unpretentious offer a clear glimpse of who he is as an artist and craftsman and why his recognition as an ACC fellow is so important. So in Mark's own words, I have been making functional pottery outside of and as part of an academic career for a long time now. I am particularly interested in the wide range and vigor of objects found in the domestic space. I revisit what I think of as the architecture of vessels and the spaces in which they are found and used quite often. Even though I sometimes don't know quite what architecture means in relationship to this inherently amorphous material, the notion of architecture, agricultural storage buildings in particular, and structure is almost always part of my vision and thought process. I like the idea of making pots that securely take up residence at the table, and in doing so, provide symmetry and equality among the seated guests, and whose role in the meal is to do the work and also to stay out of the way. Please join me in congratulating Mark Ferris. Thank you, Tom. Thanks to Anne, and, and thanks to the American Craft Council. It's a great honor. Hi, Preston. Preston Singletary's work is imbued with the vibrant Native American artistic traditions of the Pacific Northwest Coast. Preston studies old Northwest Coast designs made in traditional materials, such as cedar, shell, bone, bark, and roots, and he gives them new life in a contemporary non-traditional medium, glass. A Tlingit tribal member who was raised in Seattle, Preston's journey in glass has been a unique one. While his great grandmother kept a pet grizzly bear as a child at her home in Southeast Alaska, Preston grew up in an urban environment unconnected to his roots. Building a career as a glassblower interested in Italian and Scandinavian design, 
he had a life-changing experience when he met the Native American glass blower, Tony Hohola, who urged him to explore his Tlingit ancestry in his work. Through teaching and collaborating with other Native artists, Preston discovered that glass could bring another dimension to Indigenous art. My work with glass transforms the notion that Native artists are only best when traditional materials are used, Preston says. It has helped advocate on behalf of all Indigenous people, affirming that we are still here and that we are declaring who we are through our art in connection with our culture. In 2001, Preston embarked on a new direction in his art by working with the Alaskan sculptor, David Svensson, to realize a monumental totem pole commissioned by the Pilchuck Glass School. Since then, Preston has continued to create architecturally scaled works in addition to immersive environments, such as his recent traveling exhibition, Raven and the Box of Daylight. His work has become increasingly collaborative at, as it has increased in scale and scope. A recent work in cast glass, Killer Well Totem, stands over eight feet high and weighs more than 2,000 pounds. A trustee of Pilchuck and of the Corning Museum of Glass, Preston is an exciting addition to the Craft Council's College of Fellows. Congratulations, Preston. Liz Cheesh, thank you so much for this honor. I'll just start out by proclaiming what I believe to be true. That Tip Tolan is one of the most, if not the most courageous ceramicists working today. Her raw, sensitive and scary figures are truthful and painful. She tries to show the reality of being human through the excellent rendering of the reality of a body. No words or explanations, just a title and impeccable technique to shape and imagine the body in torment or unself-conscious expression. Her compassion is so strong for these individuals that it extends to us, the viewers. We feel that what they are feeling and we are sympathetic, disgusted or provoked to react in some way. Kiff says, Tip says she wants the reality of the figure to be close enough that you can almost feel the heartbeat even though you know it's a sculpture. You're touched by the figure empathize more fully with the person. They are not easy to experience. Tip's work is unusual in the ceramics field. It's very rare that you see figurative work or really any work in the craft field that reckons with such raw emotions or the withering process of the body as it is aging. The craft field is usually not extreme enough for that. It's a nice place for the most part where the vile and horrific aspects of life are just not discussed but she does discuss them. Old age with all its wrinkles and saggy skin especially is depicted. Fear and silliness come through as well as joy and illness. Old age is hard to look at in this culture of youth. So just that alone is more than enough to distinguish her work. The figures seem to suggest a narrative about their lives. You can't help but immediately trying to place them in a story, which Tip does as she is working on them. Mostly, she says they're self-portraits. Who is this person and how did she develop this attitude towards making? Tip earned her F BFA in ceramics at the University of Colorado and later received an MFA in ceramics from Montana State University. She started out mostly making cartoons of people and then she became interested in clay. She experimented with the interaction between the drawings and the ceramic sculptures. And then she did something most ceramicists never did at the time. She painted on the clay. It was almost a forbidden thing to do here. Again, she has gone off the rails of the craft world and courageously pursued her own path. Kip Tolan's Previous accolades include a visual arts fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts, artists in residences in Wyoming, Oregon, Montana, and Washington, an Artist Trust Gap Award, and the Virginia A. Group Foundation grant, among others. Also, 
among others, the museums that hold her work include the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Arts and Design, the Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts, Yellowstone Art Museum, Dom Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Archie Bray Foundation. Tip says, at times one wonders in the many months of making in one's basement alone if this is nuts or not. My belief is that it is nuts. And at the same time, it's a calling. Congratulations, Tip, on receiving this honor of belonging to the College of Fellows from the American yeah. Council. Thank you, Susan. That's so kind. And I honored to be part of this. Um, this company of artists. Thank you so much. Dr. Carolyn Maslumi received her doctorate in aerospace engineering. It's a stretch to imagine leaping from engineer to quilt maker storyteller but she is a force and when she sets her mind to something it happens immediately after the george floyd murder out of her outrage and pain she knew an exhibit had to happen and the idea for we are the story a visual response to racism was born seven venues in the twin cities in collaboration with the textile center in minneapolis showed the work which was created and became a traveling exhibit. She founded the African American Quilt Guild of Los Angeles and the Women of Color Quilters Network. Her impact is felt across the country. Her generosity and support encouraging makers' voices and quilts has been visibly evident in many museum exhibitions. Curated by Dr. Maslumi, Black Pioneers Legacy in the American West has just opened in St. Petersburg, Florida at the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art. Uncovering Black History, 60 quilts from her own extensive collection will be shown at the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, October 21st through March 25th. In her own narrative quilts in black and white, she tirelessly confronts the tough stuff, giving voice to African American history, speaking eloquently and powerfully of the need on the part of all of us to work toward diversity in our lives and in our institutions. Please join me in expressing our gratitude and congratulations to Dr. Carolyn Maslumi. Thank you, Pat. And I would also like to thank the American uh, Craft Council for this honor. Thank you. Scholar, writer, and curator Howard Rosati has been instrumental in defining our collective understanding of craft in contemporary society. He is Emeritus Professor of Contemporary Art and Critical Theory at Virginia Commonwealth University, where he served as Chair of the Department of Craft Material Studies from 2001 to 2005. He is the author of numerous books, including Skilled Work, American Craft in the Renwick Gallery, which he co-authored with Kenneth Trapp, The Mountain Lake Workshops, Artists in Locale, which accompanied the exhibition he curated of the same title. Postmodern Perspectives, Issues in Contemporary Art and New Music Vocabulary. In his best known book, A Theory of Craft, Function and Aesthetic Expression, Rosati compares handmade ceramics, glass, metalwork, weaving and furniture to painting, sculpture, photography, and machine-made design, from Bauhaus to the Memphis group. Craft, he argues, uniquely integrates function with a profound aesthetic expression of human values that transcend time and culture. 
Rosati has co-curated exhibitions, including Art and Artifice at James Madison University and Ambiguity and Interface at Taubman Museum of Art. He contributed to many journals, including New Art Examiner, Art Journal, Art Forum, and Blackbird, an online journal of literature and the arts. Please join me in congratulating Howard Rosati as he is recognized as an honorary fellow of the American Craft Council. Hi, Lowry. <laughs> Hi, Tina. <laughs> An internationally respected specialist in modern and contemporary art, Dr. Lowry Stokes Sims has had a long and successful curatorial career, focusing her gaze on African, African American, Latinx, Native, and Asian American artists at a time when few curators did. During her tenure as curator and chief curator at the Museum of Arts and Design from 2007 to 2015, her exhibitions and her writings contributed new and important scholarship to the field of contemporary craft. She brought expanded and diverse perspectives to craft, erasing divisions between art and design, high and low, and individual and collective. How does most of the art world know Lowry? As an award-winning American historian and curator of modern and contemporary art. Artists Lowry has written about include Wilfredo Lamb, Fritz Scholder, Romare Bearden, Robert Colescott, Fred Brown, Sonia Clark, Wendy Maruyama, uh, John Quick to see Smith, and Betty and Allison Saar. She has also organized exhibitions on the work of Stuart Davis, John Marin, Ellsworth Kelly, Viola Fry, and Joyce Scott. She is a founding board member of the national organization Art Table Inc. Lowry's knowledge of modern and contemporary art is vast and is in large part the result of having spent 24 years as a curator of 20th century art from 1975 to 1999 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. After leaving the Met, Lowry served as the director and then president of the Studio Museum in Harlem from 2000 to 2007. And before moving on to the Museum of Arts and Design, she served as a visiting professor and scholar at several well-known American colleges and universities. As you can see, Lowry brings much distinction to the College of Fellows, representing someone who may not be from a craft background, but who has significantly impacted and broadened our world. Congratulations, Lowry. Thank you so much, Tina. It's a joy to receive this honor from you. And I thank the American Craft Council for recognizing someone who is essentially a genre slut. I just go from art, craft to design and love every minute. Thank you. Do it. <laughs> Sorry, Stoney, if you could please turn your camera back on. There he is. It's my great pleasure to speak about Stoney Lamar. I'm Gary Smith, the chair of the board of the ACC. Stoney is, of course, a consummate artist with a large body of bold and imaginative work that speak for him far better than I can. You can see a couple of his pieces behind me on the shelf. Um, his work is original and daring. He respects the material, but finds inventive ways to make it express his, his ideas and emotions. I suspect that everyone who studied his work has had a, how did he do that moment? What I think people resonate to, however, is that there's a soul to his work. Something touches you about the precarious balance you see in his pieces. It's as if he's speaking to the struggles we all have finding balance in our lives. But we don't honor Stoney just, be, just for his work, which is certainly worthy of honor. Um, in addition to his life as a maker, Stoney has been consistently 
a generous contributor to the field of wood art and the craft community at large. He served as the president of the Southern Highlands Craft Handicraft Guild. He was a founding board member and president of the Center for Craft and a trustee of the American Craft Council. All of us have benefited from his wisdom and insight. Stoney has been a teacher and a mentor to aspiring artists such as Mark Gardner and many others who've gone on to become successful makers in their own right. And I know how important to him are the Wingate Lamar Fellowships of the Center for Craft that support the bright future of craft. Most importantly for me, however, is that Stoney is a friend. We met, we met in the mid nineties and it was through him that I met Robin Horn and became involved in the creation of the Collectors of Wood Art organization. Stoney's one of the people who opened my eyes to the beauty and the inspiration that can be found in a carefully crafted object. Stoney, you've enriched my life immeasurably and your work has enriched the world. Please join me in congratulating Stoney for his lifetime of multifaceted contributions to American craft for which the American Craft Council Board of Trustees has awarded him our award of distinction. Congratulations, Tony. Thank you, Gary. It's really, it's really a great honor to, to, to be recognized by the council and, and, by, and by you in particular. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Hello, Charlotte. Hi, Andrea. It is my honor to present our two Eileen Osborne Webb Awards for Philanthropy. Named for the visionary founder of ACC, this award honors exceptional philanthropic contributions to the field of craft. Our first recipient is Charlotte Herrera. Charlotte is a craft enthusiast and collector. 22 years ago, she co-founded the Fine Craft Show at Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester, New York, an event she has continued to advance as an organizer and a passionate volunteer. Charlotte's love of craft began in childhood when she made clothes that garnered awards of excellence. As an adult, Charlotte volunteered at a fundraiser that included the sale of exquisite handmade glass objects and sculpture, and that set her out on the collecting path. Charlotte's long dedication to the Fine Craft Show has been driven by her desire to support craft artists by providing them with a venue for exhibiting and selling their work. In the true craft tradition, she and her team also host artists in their homes, provide dinner and conversation, and willingly offer any support that an artist might need to achieve success. Charlotte served for nine years as an ACC trustee and four years as the board show chair. She is a member of the Memorial Art Gallery's Board of Managers and an advisory board, the advisory board of the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum in Alfred, New York. Charlotte has said of her love for craft, quote, my husband and I are collectors, but we've never collected because someone said a piece was important or significant. We collect what we're visually attracted to what creates a special feeling, not something mass produced, but one beautiful piece someone made. In doing so, we've been able to meet artists, discuss materials and techniques and support craft makers livelihoods. Congratulations, Charlotte. Thank you. And I now present the Eileen Osborne Webb Award for Philanthropy to Patricia Young. Hi, Patty. Patty is a retired clinical social worker who is also an ardent craft advocate and collector. She views herself as a craft chaplain, a role that involves, quote, always thinking of and implementing new ways to strengthen and keep the craft village together and inspire emerging artists along with the next generation of collectors. Patty developed a passion for craft shows in her early 20s. She has since traveled the world learning about craft through hands-on classes, meetings with makers and collectors, and studio visits. Supporting the makers and their work is what brings Patty the greatest joy, and the depth of her commitment and knowledge is what led her to become a show judge for the ACC, the James Renwick Alliance for Craft, and the National Capital Art Glass Guild. Patty is intrigued by all craft mediums. She donated a marble piece by Sebastian Martirana to the Renwick Gallery's 40 Under 40 show. 
in 2019, she responded, I'm sorry, she sponsored the Renwick Alliance's Chrysalis Award for Emerging Artists, which was presented to mixed media sculptor Richard James. She has also supported fiber art, glass, clay, and wood turning organizations and artists. Patty has served on the boards of the American Craft Council, Renwick Alliance, and the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. According to Patty, what's special and unique about being involved in craft is supporting artists so they can do what they do best. Well said. Congratulations, Patty. Thank you for this honor. At this time, please join me in enjoying the second part of our two part awards video. Well, I had, I had this whole uh, ceramic background. So it was like I knew things, shapes and things I wanted to make. And, uh, and I figured out I could do, I could do a lot of that in glass, even though there's, there's not a lot of it I've never seen anybody do before, but I figured out how to do it. And it, uh, it kept me entertained for decades. Yeah. The first human figure I did, uh, you know, that was realistic. Uh, was called a clothesline robbery. It's a woman who's sitting on a car, on the hood of a car. And so that was kind of a key piece because I was doing uh, this realistic figure, this woman who's flashing through this clothesline. <laughs> so that piece led on to this bridge piece and it has 72 Northwest artists in it. And that piece was kind of a key piece for me because first of all, I worked on that series of, of figures for about 10 years. So I was given this commission. So I decided that I would celebrate Seattle in that all of a sudden Seattle was starting to open up. It became more of a you know, very, very established art center. I think it was six pieces they were, I was doing doll faces then. It was the same image, you know, it just translated differently textile wise. This one's sad, this one's happy, this one's angry, this one's, it just blew my mind that it could have, people could have such a different response to the same image, just translated slightly differently. And so I started building a piece. Eventually it turned into a 32 piece. Uh, and then I kind of had enough. <laughs> Jason, I think this is the point that I invite all of the awardees to turn on their cameras for some award unwrapping. Am I on oh. the right page? Okay, I thought it was the end of the video, but we can do that now. I Maybe I, I wrongly thought we were at the end of the video. All right, I'm I'm going to take silence uh, from our from our runner of the show to say uh, this is the point that I am going to ask all of our awardees to please turn on your cameras. We're going to see if we can make this work. I understand how how it would work. We uh, will will more or less all be on the screen together. And for those who are um, who are here to celebrate with us, I'd like you to know that all of our award recipients have received by mail a beautiful award uh, commemorating the event today. You should all have an envelope. If you could please take that and I'll just give you all a kind of a minute to, to be ready. And I invite you, I invite you all to open your awards. You, so you can show them. And Please give us a moment to get everyone on the screen. Oh, all right. Um, I'm Andrea, the I, game. I do apologize. I did not see the, the note that the screen sharing had stopped. And okay. I was still hearing the video. So that was my confusion. And I apologize for that. But we're going to get everyone so up on screen we, and move to the next portion. Yeah. And as you can see, we are, you know, we did not have a dress rehearsal. We've done our best. So thank you for bearing with us, everybody, on the improvisational nature. Special events always have the unexpected. So. Um, <laughs> I hope you all, as I see you again, um, coming onto the screen and looking at your beautiful awards, congratulations again to all of you and please enjoy these and, and treasure them.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have congratulations. <laughs> and I do apologize. I want to come in with one more note here, which is that we have also hit a Zoom limit I was unaware of, which is only nine people can be in the spotlight at a time. So right. what I'm going to do is remove these spotlights all together so that we can have everyone on screen who is on camera. Okay. And give me just a moment to finish that here. And we, we will, of course, send out a link to view the video as well. Um, once again, apologies for that. Um, now we should have everyone back on screen for this moment. All right, and I think this is when I hand over the uh, baton here or the microphone back to Gary Smith for a toast. And give us just a moment. I'm going to mute all and then unmute Gary. Yeah. Gary, you are on. I'm going to All put right. you in the spotlight here. Thank you very much. What a wonderful group to be celebrating here today. And I am so pleased to be part of this and so grateful for, on behalf of ACC for everyone who has come to join us in this celebration. So I invite all of you to find a glass and get ready to join me in this toast. Um, all of these people here today have unquestionably earned the awards we've bestowed on them on behalf of the craft community. Makers, teachers, mentors, scholars, benefactors, they've all made important, even essential contributions to the world of craft. Thanks to the makers, our world is full of objects to which we can turn for the pure joy of experiencing beauty, but in which we can also find inspiration and challenge and comfort. To those who are teachers and mentors, we're grateful for what you've given to the future of craft and to the scholars who've given us a language for expressing our thoughts about craft. And to Patty and Charlotte and others who've so generously supported institutions like ACC, it's because of you that there are support structures and advocates for this important work. We celebrate today decades of wonderful, important work by these award recipients and thank them for their contributions to the history of craft and for laying the foundation for the bright future of craft. To them all, we say thanks and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Here, here. Cheers. And Cheers. congratulations again to all. And Rachel, I see you've placed a note in the chat. Again, we did run into a bit of a technical glitch with our video. So we're going to try to, to get back to where we left off there. We don't want anyone to miss anyone to miss the great video if we can if we can cue that back up. So let's see if we can make that happen. I am queuing that up right now. Give me just a moment and we'll be back on. Well, I had I had this whole uh, ceramic background, so it was like I knew things, shapes, and things I wanted to make, and. Uh, and I figured out I could do I could do a lot of that in glass, even though there's there's not a lot of it I've never seen anybody do before. But I figured out how to do it, and it uh, it kept me entertained for decades. Yeah. The first human figure I did, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was realistic, uh, was called a clothesline robbery. It's a woman who's sitting on a car, on the hood of a car. And so that was kind of a key piece because I was doing a, this realistic figure, this woman who's flashing through this clothesline. <laughs> so that piece led on to this bridge piece and it has 72 Northwest artists in it. And that piece was kind of a key piece for me because first of all, I worked on that series of, of figures for about 10 years. So I was given this commission. So I decided that I would celebrate Seattle in that all of a sudden Seattle was starting to open up. It became more of a, you know, very, very established art center. 
think it was six pieces they were, I was doing doll faces then. It was the same image, you know? It just translated differently, textile-wise. This one's sad, this one's happy, this one's angry, this one's, it just blew my mind that it could have, people could have such a different response to the same image, just translated slightly differently. And so I started building a piece. Eventually, it turned into a 32 piece. Uh, and then I kind of had enough. <laughs> From the technique that I learned, I learned how to make cubes. And then by looking at a digital clock on our microwave, I figured I could weave those and have them turn and rotate. So I made 16 cubes that if you turn them around, you get either the date or you get initials because you can really sort of spell with them. I'm not striving for anything. It's the, the work is so personal that I'm just trying to, I'm trying to find out, this has been said a million times, who I am. A basket is just a layer that when you put them in it, and the body has a same idea. It has an outside surface that everything goes inside of it. So that skin layer is nothing more than a container that holds that person together. And that's what baskets do. So I could start to feel like no matter what I made, it was both a container like a basket is, and there were also containers of many different uh, things. And even, even an idea, like a sentence, has a beginning and an end. So it's a sentence is, is contained, and, and you can just uh, go down the list of thousands of things. Gary Knox Bennett. Yes, yeah. Gary Knox Bennett. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he called me one day and said, you know, I have this piece of yours that I, I could take to the foundry and see if they could cast it in bronze. Mm -hmm. How would you? How would you like that? <laughs> and I said, I'd love that, but I'd like to design a piece of furniture that was meant to be in bronze, mm. not meant to be in wood. Mm -hmm. This is great because you can do things in bronze that you cannot do in wood because mm -hmm. of the wood will break if it has a big curve in it. But I could, you know, make that in bronze and it could be any shape. I mm -hmm. wanted him. That was a really exciting thing because, you know, I liked making these animal forms and I could suddenly make an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> For the quadricentennial anniversary of the first landing of Africans in this country in 1619, I curated an exhibition called And Still We Rise where I trace that history from 1619 to present day. That show made a difference because people from outside of the uh, culture knew the contributions of African-Americans, all the trials and tribulations that they've been through. It makes a difference. It makes a difference when people know you. And that's what the show, uh, And Still We Rise, was about. This came about as a friendship with uh, some folks that, that were were in, involved in philanthropy in, in, in the field. And I started doing some kind of pro bono work for them, just kind of going around the country and, and seeing what, what, what was happening. And um, that led to me actually working for them. Folks could, they, they could call and talk to me and I could give them a sense of whether or not what they were talking about was, you know, would be a possibility for funding. It just was so rewarding because, uh, you know, it, it put me in touch with schools and institutions that are doing just doing fantastic work, you know, in terms of educating people. Really, that all started in the late '80s, and I've been doing it ever since. Two big exhibitions I organized while I was at the Museum of Arts and Design. The first was the Global African Project in 2010. And then 2014, New Territories, Laboratories for Design, Craft, and Art in Latin America. By the time I did Latin American show, it was like, you know, sort of the zenith of the time when designers were sort of really coming to grips with the marketplace, 
their collaborations with traditional designers and family fabricators. I thought a lot about machine-made things, which it seems to me uh, like Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona chair, which I really like, it's a beautiful chair. He made it for the Barcelona Pavilion in 1929. You can still buy that chair. You can't buy a Sam Maloof chair. You can't buy a Nakasima chair. When he dies, they stop. So the craft objects are connected to people's lives, to the artist, to moments in time. And I think to hold those objects is to have some connection to somebody in a moment in time and can't be replaced. Uh, jewelry turns out to have an extremely rich and deep history of connections, of course, with the personal, with the bodily, with the, the intimate, with the sentimental. And all of those were, were attributes that I felt would be very useful in pursuing the subject matter I was most interested in, which was gay ma male identity, queer identity in general, and the situation that I found myself in the mid 80s, which was smack dab in the middle of the, of the AIDS pandemic, along with all other uh, 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 people um, in the queer community at that time. The impulse, the artistic impulse is, is the truth. The medium comes and goes through human history. So I don't care what things are made out of. That is a huge lesson over the last 50 years of life. It doesn't matter what things are made out of. What matters is the story behind it and the intentions behind it. That's it. That's the human spirit that is placed into those objects that we give away, right? That's what we're doing. It's, it's that movement. It's so compelling to see if you could make a character and have them live you know like really like come to life it's sort of it's just the most profound feeling if it, when it can happen and have have some sort of an energy like bring something into this world with energy this just blows my mind really one guy referred to it as modern heritage art which I think that is really a good way of putting it because it is modern art, but it's connected to my heritage. And so, you know, that's, you know, essentially what I do is, is uh, uh, sometimes trying to represent the cultural objects, you know, in their traditional form. But then, you know, over the years, I've tended to go more abstract with it and uh, learn how to play with it in different ways. But, um, I think that that was really a defining moment. Every new piece that I design, uh, I design as, as a challenge. Whenever I design a new pattern, it's a lot of work. And it starts off with research and then sometimes even just picking a mark or two or a shape or two. And then I start putting things together and it's that reflected light off of the facets of the carving that for me is the magical part of the work. So I, I started to pursue a, a CAD program that would uh, fold and unfold um, a volume so that I could design a volume on the screen and unfold that volume into a two-dimensional pattern and then print that out. But that was transformational. There, that was, a, that was um, in a kind of epiphany. It just gave me another way of seeing the world, you know? And, and it opened, a, opened the doorway to form that, is, um, that wasn't possible on the wheel. When I began to want to make freestanding things, it just wasn't working so well. But I had this wire already, so I tried it and I really liked it. And I've always been very interested in, ar in architecture. And it was kind of a natural fit. The geometrics of the city are, are really quite wonderful. And it's something that, yes, definitely influenced my work. And I have done a lot of free, tall freestanding pieces. My biggest thing I'm always looking at is how does this world work? What is 
are, you know, we're these humans that are here. What is it that we're doing? And, you know, and how can we save the world? And so I do it by digging into the history and pulling out the history and making the work that, that then helps other people to see, you know, our history. I think it's a privilege to be able to participate both in sharing knowledge. To me, there's giving in two senses. There's giving whatever you can give to organizations in a monetary point. But I think philanthropy goes far beyond that. It's not just giving and then forgetting about the organization that you're giving to, but giving something back to the organization when you have the opportunity from a personal standpoint. I, I do it because I can, because it's my passion, because even though it may be a little drop in the bucket here, it does make a difference. And I, I do it because I appreciate where I am in the world of craft and my modest influence means even more to some of the makers. And, and I don't want to waste that. I want to honor that for them and for me. Uh, I don't think without the American Press uh, Council that clay and jewelry and some of these other areas like fiber uh, would have the recognition and the popularity that it does without that organization. It's hugely important. And that is the true end to the video. So thank you for bearing with us, everybody, as we got that working again. And I am inspired, I'm humbled, I'm grateful. And I suspect I am not alone um, in all of those things. So someone had put in the chat earlier that they had hoped we would have a chance just to do a bit of a social, which is hard on Zoom, but we're going to try it. And Rachel tells me it actually works relatively well. So at this point, I want to bring the official program to a close. Thank you again to our presenters and our awardees. Congratulations. Thank you to everyone for attending. And I invite all of you, including attendees, to stay on and unmute yourselves. And we'll see how this works, to have a little, a little social moment. But this is the official end to our program. Thank you again. Um, it's an honor. And it's been, it's been an honor and a privilege to spend this time with all of you. Yeah.